Welcome back to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to our channel for our weekly content. Today's guest is the Karate Combat Middleweight World Champion, Ross Turbo Levine. Ross, welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you guys for having me. Appreciate your time. Yeah, doing well. Getting over a little bit of a cold, a little sore throat, but I feel like everybody is right now, so it's all good. Yeah, it's definitely a time of year, mate. You sound good, though, so I won't worry. Appreciate it. So obviously, we just introduced you to our audience, but you are the current middleweight champion for uh, Karate Combat. Yes, sir. I think just just back, uh, what, sort of six weeks ago, I think you had a very close fight for the heavyweight title as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously come up a little bit short, um, but would have been the first person to be the the two-time or sorry, two-weight champion uh, in Karate Combat. So six weeks in, how are you feeling after that fight? What's your reflections on it? I mean, I feel great. You know, the uh, the fight was a challenging one. The big challenge, obviously, was the discrepancy in size. I mean, Sam is tremendous. He's a big dude. He's six six two, six three. Um, you know, even though we both weighed in at the two hundred five limit, you know, he rehydrated to two thirty five, two forty um, <laughs> in pounds. So, I mean, he was a big guy, man. And um, I felt, from a striking standpoint, I did very well. I did everything I was supposed to do. Um, you know, everything I would have done, you know, even if this was a fight at 185, um, the, the sad part was he was able to really handle those shots very well. He weathered the storm, you know, quite well and better than I expected, to be honest. And, uh, you know, I just, with the size difference, I just couldn't keep him off me when he, when he grabbed a hold of me, that's where the major difference was. Um, mm -hmm. but even, even with that being said, you know, based on the karate combat rule set, I really felt like I did a great job. I thought, despite the the ground and pound you know the the striking was heavily favored in my in my department so you know you look at the fight and it's like i might have be able to win based on the rule set um physically i don't think i won i mean i just never i'd never felt physically beat up in a fight before that was the first for me um but you know what man great learning experiences to be in there with a guy like sam who's had over 80 professional fights like i'm only going to get better from that so i really have no you know my head's not low uh, by any means yeah, no, good, mate. It was a super close fight, mate. So, um, Thank you. So, yeah, you should definitely be proud of that one. And then, I guess, karate combat, it's a relatively new sport. And Danny and I, were, you know, we, we've seen a number of fights online, but we're not enough in the detail to really understand the rule set. And you just alluded to them a second sure. ago. And, and I, I understand that the, the, the rules seem to be evolving quite quickly as well. Mm. So can you explain just a little bit about what karate combat is and, I guess, how it differs to, to normal karate competition? For sure. Well, I mean, uh, originally Karate Combat started off, I want to say they're in year five or six now. Um, I think we're going, going towards year six. And so this was pre-COVID. They had done a couple pilot shows to test it out. And the original idea with the original people who were running Karate Combat um, were all WKF based. And they were saying it's ridiculous how we have these karate practitioners who the goal of training, even in point karate, is to deliver a kill shot you know, something that would cause damage, but with enough control that we don't actually cause damage. And you see someone in the Olympics, you knock someone out in the gold medal match and lose. It's mm. like, that's, it doesn't make any sense. So the, the goal behind Karate Combat was let's develop this platform for karate practitioners to go to have that next level where, listen, if you want to stay on the point side of things, if you want to be Olympic karate and do that, that's fine. If you want to test your skills in more of a full contact setting, we have an element and a, and a platform where you can do that, where in the past, it never existed. It was you either do point style karate or you transition into kickboxing, boxing, MMA, and you have to go that route. There was nothing for karate practitioners at the professional level until karate combat. So the, the base rule set was that you could not kick the thigh. You can only kick below the knee. And the reason for that is just to keep it more long range and more dynamic. Um, and then there were sweeps and throws that are allowed, you know, no double leg, single leg takedowns, but, but you can utilize ground and pound for five seconds and they stand you up and you're back at it. And then of course you have the pit. So um, it, it, it provided a, a really cool and unique environment for these karate fighters to, to go and explore what they were capable of. Um, you know, so that was kind of the original uh, karate combat the way it started yeah did you always have that sort of pit arena as well or is that is that something that's um been a sort of more recent in, uh, introduction so that was always with karate combat yeah that was okay. the obviously that was the main attraction for karate combat yeah. is you, you saw this so cool. this 
pit and it's like, oh my gosh, it's so different. It's not a cage. It's not a ring. They also were doing, you know, outdoor events pre COVID. They did one like downtown Miami. They did an event, um, at the top of the world trade center in, in New York city. It was unbelievable. Um, and then when COVID hit, they switched over to more of the sound stage where you see now you have the green screen, the CGI, all that stuff. So again, just really creative ways to, you know, entertain the fans and, and be unique. And, you know, I think the original game plan was if the US, the UFC, Bellator, PFL, they're all, go, all going this way, Karate Combat's going to go that way. And it was working. Yeah, no, it looks wicked. And I know with the with that sort of the the edge or the the sort of the slope of of the of the mm. pit there's there's some interesting rules around that right because i think correct me if i'm wrong but i think there's like a 5 second ground and pound rule but that doesn't apply if yeah, yeah it's, that's changed okay you can tell us about that in a second so but i think if they're on that slope that doesn't apply right so you can essentially correct. still hit them and kick them in the head yeah, so tell us about, yeah, if about that so so the way the so the rules were um if your butt is touching the ground, the floor level, you're a downed opponent, that starts the five seconds, and then after those five seconds, you're up. If you're against the pit wall, you're essentially a standing opponent, so everything is legal. You can kick the head, knee to the head. I mean, flying technique, if you've seen some of my fights, uh, one of my fights ended with that spinning kick against the pit wall. So yeah, I've seen um, that, it, it, it makes, savage. It makes for a crazy... Savage. Yeah, it makes for a crazy environment with uh, all new kind of rules that apply. So, you know, and it also looks like it's not as steep as it is. When you get there and you fall back on that wall, it is very steep. You, it's very hard to get up without committing your hands. So it's a bad place to be. You guys saw that even in my fight with, with Sam. Like, I just, it was hard to get off there. You got to almost push him away and sink to the ground just to get that second the the timer going so you can protect yourself and get up otherwise you get stuck on that wall man you're there until you're not and and then again just for, for our audience who aren't familiar with what are the, the round times and and you know the, the like the amount of rounds and everything else yeah so it's three two minute rounds or excuse me three three minute rounds and um pr, you know title fights are five minute or five three minute rounds my brain is all off today all three minute rounds three rounds for non-title fights, five rounds for a title fight. But the cool thing with Karate Combat is there are no split decisions and there is no draw. So if we have a split decision or a draw, you automatically go to an extra round. And I think that's what sets Karate Combat also apart from some of these other events where you get these weird decisions and you're not really sure. Um, and the cool thing with that sudden death round or sudden victory round is nothing else matters only the winner of that round moves on and wins. so you know like for example my fight with sam i did a five round title fight the judges had it split i don't know what it was um i don't know if they had me winning him winning doesn't matter you go to that sixth round whoever wins that round wins <laughs> yeah that's fucking crazy that's such a good it's way nuts. of doing it i like yeah. it i like a lot of people don't like it why do they not like it though i think it's fucking i think that's phenomenal i, I think for I don't from, know. from an entertainment point of view like there's uh, that's so cool isn't it imagine like yeah. all the ufc fights and stuff where they're like split decisions you know give them another round <laughs> stick them in for another yeah, round and they're fucking yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's decent you know i think a lot of people will say that um you know in other majority sports if you have a winner you have a winner right so like in basketball it, well the thing is there it's not subjective right? Like fighting is such a subjective sport because it's not like, hey, if you put the ball in the hoop, you score points. It, martial arts and, and combat sports doesn't work that way. It's very subjective. You have these three people who are judging what you do. Um, and if you don't finish the fight, it's kind of up to them, you know, to follow some type of criteria. Um, so I love the fact that, listen, if, uh, if it's a split decision, if I wasn't perfect enough to determine all of these three eyewitnesses to show that I won, well, then I need to do something else, you know? So in that scenario, I'm all for it. But uh, mm -hmm. I guess uh, I don't really know why people don't like it. I think it's silly. Give me a chance to, to rectify whatever you didn't like. You know, if you, if you two are judging my fight and somebody else, and one of you voted for me and, and the other one voted for the other guy, like let's say, Danny, you voted for me, Paul, you voted for the other guy. Give me another round to convince you, Paul, that I should win. You know what I mean? Like, I'm all for that. Yeah, definitely. And how did you feel then coming out for that sixth round against Sam? Like, how, so were you, like, it, how, how was the body feeling at that point? Terrible. <laughs> I, was <feeling laughs> ter I, I was feeling how you expected me to feel. 
<laughs> not too good. But, um, you know, it's funny because in the moment, you always feel like, I don't know if you guys have any competitive sports backgrounds, but um, a lot of times in the moment, you never feel like you're doing as well as you are. Mm. Uh, you know, I may feel like I'm in control of a fight, but it's very rare that I actually come out of a fight. I'm just very critical of myself. So I'm always trying to adapt and do something better and do something better. So at the end of five rounds, I didn't feel like I won. Um, and I think it's more physically. I, like I said before, I never felt so physically worn down after a fight. So I didn't think I won. Um, now watching the fight back, you could argue that I did win. Um, but again, the water under the bridge. So when they announced the sixth round, my brain was like, all right, let's go. Like I got a chance to win this thing. So I was pumped about the sixth round. Yeah. Okay. That's good. And I guess, I guess if you were the maybe sort of a bit more optimistic in regard to your sort of self-assessment, perhaps it might be quite soul destroying, maybe going into that sixth round. I don't know. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I always prepare for that, you know, so like when, they say you prepare for a five round title fight, you know, even when I wasn't fighting, uh, like those rules that that extra round rule existed from the the entirety that I've been part of karate combat. I'm not sure if it was there beforehand, but I've always been a part of it. So, you know, when I was training for three round fights, I was really training for four round fights. So I was always prepared just in case. How can you ever be unprepared for something that the rules might throw at you? You know, so um, I, I've always been prepared. Uh, you know, my cardio was good. Even, you know, you see me in the sixth round, I was just as fresh as I was in the fifth. So, you know, cardio wise, that's never an issue. But yeah, it's, it's a new element that you don't see in other combat sports, mm. which I think another, it's just another checkbox next to karate combat of why it's so cool and different and unique. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It's fascinating. And why? Why do you think it's recently blowing up so much? I find like I never really heard of it until about probably about twelve months ago, and then especially in the UK, and maybe the last three or four months, especially, I've just seen it everywhere. Everywhere. Is there a particular reason for that? Or yeah, I mean, I think it's just growing in popularity. They started promoting a lot differently. Um, even so, you know, if you're saying you've noticed it maybe in the last year, um, the the president beforehand, Adam Kovach, they, one of their big things was trying to, to bring in a lot more people that have some star power. Um, even in the UK, they, they started adding more UK talent. Uh, there's a kid who I'm, I'm super close to, Elijah Everill. Uh, if you haven't followed him, he's a phenomenal, phenomenal young man and an amazing fighter. But um, even prior to his Karate Combat debut, but uh, yeah, they're bringing in more talent from the UK. Um, but they're also bringing in just bigger names. You have myself, you have Raymond Daniels, Sam Alvey, you know, and uh, Rafael Gaev is now a, a bigger name. So you have these people who you can market and kind of push, and they've just really done a, a better job of, of getting it out to the public and the masses. So that's one thing. And then with the new presidency, you know, a lot of people are kind of on the fence about uh, President Awesome. You know, Dana Dana Brown is what he calls himself. But, <laughs> is that um, what he's called it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you and again, it's it's a very like he's a controversial character in in the space of M of MMA um, and combat sports. You know, his gym Goat Shed is like the most viral gym on the planet. Um, so of course, when you put someone like that who knows how to utilize the machine. Karate combat's going to blow up. So, you know, whether it's – or whether people like it or don't like it, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, more views and more views. So, um, there, you know, you can't argue the fact that it has gotten more popular. Um, but what people are arguing is, is it going in the right direction? Yeah, I don't know. I guess time will tell. I think from an outside point of view, I think it's definitely put way more eyes on, on karate combat. Mm. And yeah. I, I think it's, again, like – it's taken seriously and it is it, it looks like an amazing event like you know when you talk when when you hear like great craig jones and what he says about it and how good he like how much he loved yeah. it and then it, you know everyone who's who's going to these events are saying they're fucking mental they're just amazing they are um, <laughs> they're pretty they're pretty crazy uh, yeah. it's pretty, and it's also i think the environment too you know you go to uh if, you, if you've ever been to a ufc event or a boxing event or another you know major mma event it's very prim and proper, which is cool. You know, you want that. But also just as a, as a spectator, the view is challenging. You end up most of the time you're watching the screen, no matter where your seat is, you end up watching the monitors to see everything. Um, with Karate Combat, it's a smaller, more intimate setting. Uh, the pit is wide open. So every single seat is a great seat. You're seeing right into the action. It just feels like an underground fight club, you know? So, um, and it, it's also very close. So you can get 
you know, if you upgrade your seat and you get a VIP ticket, you can put your hands on the pit wall. You're literally right there. Um, so it's just a wild, wild time. And for the fighters, it's really cool because it's so, like I said, it's so intimate. And, um, you know, I grew up fighting sport karate where I fought on a ring and the tatami, like a matted surface. And there are people that are just sort like, there is no out of bounds because there's people there. It's just a wall of people. So I love that environment in tight. I just feel like, uh, the energy is hard to, to match. So it's really, really cool. Where was the um the last event? Wasn't that his like mum's house or something crazy? Like <laughs> yeah. That? So so that wasn't <laughs> really? that that was uh that was supposed to be just kind of a different test. So it wasn't like a numbered karate combat event. There were no rostered or excuse me, there was one rostered fighter um on that event. The rest of them were all people from other organizations or or you know other you know professional fighting venues that were looking to get into karate combat. So it was kind of like their trial. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was supposed to be, you know, a lower production value. So, but they wanted to do something kind of wild and crazy, which again, that's what we were talking about with, uh, with the new presidency. And, uh, they say, listen, my mom's got this mansion in Miami. So we're going to put the pit up on the tennis courts and have a ton of people there and have a bunch of celebrities there. And it was, it was chaos. It was cool fights. It was a party and, you know, it just, it got a lot of attention. Yeah, they got people like uh, Wagner Rocha and um, Luke Griffiths fighting jiu-jitsu and it, it, the Big Dan was there and yeah. Yeah, they, they started, <laughs> the, they started so the cool. jiu-jitsu. Yeah, they started those jiu-jitsu matches and now you see you've got, you know, Craig Jones and Phil Rowe, my buddy Phil, Philly Fresh. Uh, shout out to Phil. I'm good, good friends with Phil. You know, they're going to be at the next one in, in Mexico City in a couple of weeks doing that. So yeah, it'll be interesting, man. They're, they're again – the more eyes you can get on the sport, the more it's going to grow. I think the the issue right now is you have some of those like karate purists that were there at the beginning that are like, this isn't karate combat. And I don't blame them, but um, you also have to be willing to change sometimes. So they've got Craig Jones in Mexico doing Mexican ground karate. So <laughs> that's, that's right. Genius. That's right. It's, it's <laughs> genius. I mean, listen, it, the one thing, I don't care if you like awesome or not. There's a lot of people that do. There's a lot of people that don't. The guy knows how to market his people. He knows how to market. He knows how to utilize social media. And he's doing it, man. And like you said, it, it, it is genius. Whether you like it or not, it's hard to look away. Yeah, but to some extent, I think, well, actually, quite largely speaking, I think that's that's been the case with the UFC, isn't it? I think Dana's a similar sort of polarizing character. You know, he, he's not quite yeah. the same, but you either like him or you hate him. But sure. But I think having that that type of person sort of leading the charge with the promotion, I think can, can really make a big impact. Well, yeah, you've yeah. got to have that person at the top, haven't you? You've got to have that person at the top driving forward. If you've got people that want it to be pure and want it to be just karate guys, I think it would just, it would limit the companies massively. Whereas what they're doing now is really clever, bringing in other, other things and other people and having a bit yeah. of a mismatch with it, but it, it'll work, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, you, you have to start bringing in other elements. Uh, otherwise, your ceiling becomes very low, right? If you were only going to allow it to be a certain amount of people. Now, let's say there's only 100,000 karate practitioners in the world. Well, now your pool is very small, right? And eventually, you're going to run out of people to, to compete with, um, which, is, which is what was happening. You know, the divisions weren't developing enough depth. That for Even in my position, for example, like the middleweight division hasn't seen a lot of turnover, um, you know, the, and I kind of ran through the division really quickly, became the champion. And to be quite honest, the only reason I moved up to the 205 division to challenge for that is I had nobody at 185. So, and I want to stay active. So was that the best move for my career? Probably not. You could argue it wasn't. I mean, it was cool. You know, I wanted to fight someone like Sam who has a lot of experience, but was that the best move for my career? Probably not. But what was I going to do? I want to stay active. I can't, you know, I only fought twice last year. That's not enough for me. I need to, I'm 36 years old. I want to fight. I want to compete. You know, I want to challenge myself. So I, I did what I had to do to stay relevant, to stay busy, to, you know, collect some pay and do what I got to do to entertain my fans and, and keep myself happy. I'm passionate about this stuff. Mm. Yeah, no, fair play, mate. And just in regard to the fighters, I mean, obviously there's a particular rule set and you fight within the rule set. But the background of the fighters coming through, are they strictly karate guys or are you seeing like a mixture of, of different striking disciplines coming through and doing okay? 
Yeah, now you're starting to see some different uh, some different practitioners coming in. You know, it's funny in my case because for the longest time I was a karate guy, right? I did. I came up doing the martial arts. I was a sport karate phenom. You know, I competed all over the world, winning world championships in sport karate, point fighting. And then when I went to kickboxing, I started doing kickboxing, and my pro debut fought with Glory kickboxing. And everyone looked at me and was like, he's just a karate guy. He's not going to be successful. And I was knocking people out. And then when Karate Combat came along, they brought me in and everyone was like, oh, he's just a kickboxer. He's not even a karate guy. I'm like, oh, I can't win. No matter where I go, I can't win. Um, so now, you know, but uh, the good thing is I've, I've stayed true to myself and my fan base has followed me and grown. So I'm very appreciative of that. But um, yeah, you're seeing a lot of people that, you know, I, I can't vouch for anyone's karate background. And to be honest with you, I don't really care. Um, initially, it was supposed to be more uniquely catered to the, the people who have a true karate background, who are black belts in whatever discipline they start in. I don't think that necessarily matters um, because you have so many talented athletes. And like I said in an interview before, if you take the word karate out of karate combat, it's combat. You know, we, we want to see who who's the best, period. So I think it's cool that we're seeing, you know, there's a couple of bare knuckle fighters on the roster now. There's some MMA guys on the roster, ex-UFC athletes on the roster. You're seeing a little bit of everything. You saw um, at that last show, the the kickback, the the party in the background, they had this kid, um, I know his last name is Melendez, maybe Luis Melendez, but he, Taekwondo guy, Taekwondo world champion. Um, Damian Villa is a world champion Taekwondo fighter. So you're seeing all these different disciplines come in and, and test themselves in the pit. And um, you know, even though you would think like the MMA fighters have an advantage, they really don't because the pit is so different and so unique. Mm. Yeah. And then that was, that was going to be my next question actually, mate, in regard to do like grapplers um, Mm. or mixed martial arts have an advantage because of the, the clinching element. And also I was interested to know, I've done a bit of of mixed martial arts myself over the years and you know, there's tactics on the cage and that type of thing. Um, Do you, do you kind of like the, the two questions there, I guess. So, you know, do you notice much of a difference with the grapplers? And is it, do you have to tactic for the, those? Or and, and then the second question was around the actual arena itself. Do you create sort of tactics to utilize that as you've done in your fights? Yeah, well, let's, let's start. I'm going to reverse engineer that. So with the, the, the second question, um, the pit is so different. It's so different. Uh, because like I was saying before, you can't just get up. You can't just tighten your core and stand up. You have to commit your hands, which is so dangerous. Um, it also unleashes a whole new series of techniques that maybe you wouldn't practice or wouldn't throw um, that now you have to be aware of on both the offensive and defensive side. Um, If your back is to like, let's say I'm standing and I'm backing up, you know, it, when you look at MMA um, generally the, the octagon or the, the arena that you're in has like the vinyl, right? The mat that you're standing on. And usually there's either a line on the on the matted area itself where you kind of know when you see that line in your periphery or it's like a, like a sponsor right a logo you know like okay one more step and i'm against that cage wall you don't have that in karate combat the 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 wall and the floor are the same color so you can't see where the heck the angle is <laughs> next thing you know you're backing up you're moving and you catch your foot on it and you're tripping so um it's it's dangerous man the goal is don't be there <laughs> Um, so yeah, there are definitely some tactics and, and I try to implore those as much as I can. And if you watch all of my fights, I'm always very much trying to be on the front foot, put you backwards so that you don't have access to what you want to do. Um, so yes, there, there are some definitely specific tactics that you need, uh, in terms of the, the grappling element, you know, when I first started with karate combat, there was no double leg, single leg, anything like that. So the the throws and the trips were more judo related. Uh, so I did start training some judo just to be aware of it. Not that I was going to out grapple anybody, but I wanted to know where the dangers were. When I do get into a clinch situation, where do I need to have my body weight? Where should I be? Where should I not be? So I don't get tossed on my head. Um, you know, and especially with the five second rule, the the idea is, listen, if I do get put in that position, what are the things that I can do to stay safe so that I'm not just covering up and taking damage, but keeping distance, putting my feet in the way, you know, going between their legs, kind of almost playing like an inverted guard so that I'm not getting hit so that I can control my opponent. So that five seconds goes, I can get up to where I'm doing my best work. Things have changed, right? 
So now there's more grapplers, you know, more MMA style grapplers, more wrestling style guys where they're going to body lock and, and do like a lateral drop. Um, you know, you're seeing, you know, right now, double legs and single legs are still not legal, but I think sooner or later you'll see a push for that. Um, and now the, the ground and pound rule is unlimited as long as the fighter is trying to attack. So you kind of got to learn how to get up now, mm. which uh, it, it changes the game quite a bit. Or either learn how to get up safely or learn how to control your opponent so that they can't hit you and then you can stand up. But you can't just like put your bank on survival because a good fighter won't let you. I don't, I don't know if I like that. I, I think I prefer the five second rule, for, especially for just pure stand up. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we, so with that, Ross, with that unlimited rule, then uh, are you allowed to mm. to kind of put weight on your opponent, or have you got to stay standing and strike? So could you go into full mount and strike, for example? So you're only allowed one knee on the ground. Um, okay. So you can you can uh, you can knee on, knee on belly is yeah, fine. Yeah. Um, you know, but or a standing position or one knee on the ground, one knee elevated, and you can strike. Um, mm. So yeah, you know. It's, it's different. You know, my opinion, I personally like the five seconds. I think, mm. um, you know, and, and I even have a, a conversation with, uh, with the president about this and I voiced my opinion. Um, and he was awesome. It was great that he was able to listen to me and, you know, how many fighters actually have a say or feel like they have a voice, you know, so that's really nice. Um, it's cool that I'm able to do that and have a relationship with these guys. Um, my opinion was the the referee's job is not to dictate when the fight continues or doesn't. The referee should be hands off. They're only there to number one protect me from myself, really, and protect me from any fouls that are going on. Other than that, the referee should be very hands off. They shouldn't be a deciding factor in anything. Um, so that's the only thing I don't like about the unlimited time frame is every fight has a position uh, has a potential to look different based on the referee's opinion, you know? So for that, I liked the five second better, mm. but I do understand like, you know, a lot of people were just kind of curling up in the fetal position and getting beat up for five seconds and then standing back up. So yeah. I don't agree with, I don't really agree with that either. You know, the, the cool thing about karate combat is the the league is governed by the people, right? So you see the, uh, like the karate token, if you have uh, the wallet and the tokens, when these rule changes come about, it goes to a vote in the community um, so the fact that this got voted in by the community is great. And listen, at the end of the day, if people don't like it, can always vote back. So, yeah. you know, it's, cool. it's not, it's not a terrible thing. Yeah. Time okay. will tell. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I really hope they don't introduce uh, single and double legs though. I think that would really kind of, um, limit the, the amount of, uh, the amount people would be willing to strike for fear of, of being taken down more. I think, I don't know what you think. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I I um I don't like in double leg. I think um you know and love the single MMA has its place, and I think mm. karate combat is supposed to be going. In my opinion, I think karate combat should go in a slightly different direction. Maybe like if we're if we're parallel, we should be going a little bit the other way. You know, I don't think it should be so similar. It shouldn't be MMA in a pit. You know, it should still have its differences. And I think that's what makes it unique. And that's what makes people want to, you know, draw their attention to it because it is different. Otherwise, it's like I said, it's just MMA in a pit. And I don't know, I think it loses its luster a little bit. So, but um, with it still being so young, you know, it's still really in its infancy, you know, six years, you know, it's just, it's just a toddler, right? So you got to let it develop a little bit and, and make mistakes. I think the, um, you know, both sides, the both the old, uh, the old guard, if you want to call it that, and the new president and his people. You know, I think everyone is willing to make mistakes. The league is willing to make changes, um, which is good. You know, you can't be stuck in your ways. As the sport evolves, the league has to evolve as well. So, you know, there's going to be times throughout this growth period that you're going to like certain things and dislike certain things. And it is what it is. It's part of the growth. The UFC didn't become where it is right now because it was like this on day one. You know, you look at UFC one, you look at UFC 300, it's very, very different. So, um, you know, it, it's a good thing. We just got to keep pushing the envelope a little bit until you find out what works and then you run with it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Have you got another fight booked yet, mate? Not yet. Not yet. We're um, we're actually in talks now to start developing a plan. You know, my goal is to go back to to one eighty five, defend my title again. Um, that's my goal. That's what I would like to do. Uh, you know, there's not a ton of depth of division, but there's a couple. Um, really, one name in particular that makes a lot of sense. Um, and we're shooting for probably April or May. So as soon as they start releasing some of those dates to us, and uh, you know, my management team will come up with a good plan and you know put some work in and, and start uh, you know planning for that. But in the meantime, it's all systems go, man. I'm always training. There's no off season. I'm always getting mm-hmm. better. So we've just been developing some different things. Um, as soon as I get over this cold, I'm going to start doing some wrestling and some grappling just so I'm prepared for the new rule changes. And I'm going to be a whole other animal. You know, my goal is uh, I should look different every time I get in the pit to some extent. I should be unloading and you know, unleashing some new skills. And if I'm doing that, well, I'm always going to be ahead of the game. Yeah, 100%. And you obviously mentioned that you're 36. So, you know, you kind of, you know, sort of maybe come in, you know, not anytime soon, but obviously pushing towards the end of the career. Um, mm. I mean, thinking about, you know, the next sort of five years or so, like what what's the goal for you? Is it is it legacy fights? Is it just to hold that belt? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, ideally, I want to challenge myself and fight some of the best in the world. That's that's always been my goal as a professional. Um, I really had no intention of becoming a professional combat athlete, you know, when I was younger. My goal was just to kind of see where things went. Um, I got into full contact very late. I didn't even put on boxing gloves until I was about 27 years old. I had always done sport karate my entire life. So even now, you know, I, I've been doing full contact combat for less than 10 years that's pretty wild considering where i'm at now Mm. um you know i wish i would have gotten into it a little early because who knows what the you know i probably would have gone the the mma route and you never know and uh, i look at myself and i look at some of the guys in the ufc and bellator and pfl i'm like man i can compete with these guys uh at least on my feet you know i train with a lot of them all the all the guys in the northeast i train with them all so you know we have the same coaches and stuff like that so um you know, I think it's uh, it's just cool of how everything is progressing. And I think the next five years, uh, I would love to have, you know, another title defense or two. I'd love to, you know, maybe get a big name. I think if I would have beaten Sam, that would have opened doors a little bit sooner for maybe like a Luke Rockhold, the Darren Till. Those are names that have crossed my desk a couple of times. But, you know, maybe that gets put on hold slightly for right now. But we'll see. Yeah. My goal is always the same. You know, take whoever they put in front of me. I've never said no. You know, there's never been negotiation. It's like, you give me a name. Yes. What's mm-hmm. the date? You know, and then we move forward and we get better. So um, yeah. I'm just excited for whatever comes next, you know? Yeah, 100%. If you did have a magic wand though, mate, and you could put pick any any sort of combat athlete to come into this sport at your weight for you to compete against, who would that be? Darren Till. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, that was the name that I got most excited about when they when they started talking about that. I mean, Luke, Luke Rockhold as well. You know, Luke is phenomenal. Um, mm. I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, Luke's a little bit older. Um, he's definitely got more miles on him. Uh, I think Darren Till also with his background and, and just his like, you know, he, Darren Till was phenomenal. He just didn't do well when, when you added the wrestling in. So I think as a pure striker, it, like if you put Darren Till and Luke Rockhold in a kickboxing match, I think Darren has the advantage. Um, so that's that's the person I lean towards. I want to go towards the better strikers. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think someone like Darren Till would be a, would be like a it fucking suit a, de- it? a, a great suit. matchup. I mean, it'd be orthodox versus southpaw, and you know the that like grit gritty style that Darren has, and he talks a lot of shit. Like he's such <laughs> a good like he sells fights really well. I think it would be an amazing lead up. I think it would be a fun fight, um, and regardless of who won. I think, man, the fans would freaking love that. Yeah, no, that'd be a great fight. He's obviously one of our own, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it'd be great to see him come back. And I know he's been talking about bare knuckle as well, and I think I'd much rather yeah. see him in this sort of arena than bare knuckle. Yeah. I think it suits him better. I think karate mm. combat would be a great fit. Um, you know, he still keeps the small gloves. You know, he would mm. really just have to adjust to, you know, the pit, which is a challenge in itself. But I think it's a good uh, a good environment for him. I think he would do super well there, you know, Um even if he were to fight, you look at the the middleweight division right now. I mean, he he dusts everybody in the division except for me. You know, I think so. It, it's kind of inevitable that we would fight. So I think that would be a great spot to just open up. Hey, give this guy an immediate title shot. Or if you don't really want to compete here a lot, um, let's super fight. We don't have to put a mm-hmm. title on the line. Five round super fight. Let's go. I'm I'm up for that. 
That would be so fucking good, wouldn't it? What's he... What's he even doing now? He keeps saying he's going to box and do this and that, but the, the such a waste is of talent, trying, isn't it? The, the, the rumor is they're trying to get him and Mike Perry. Um, I don't know if it was. I, I don't know if they were talking about bare knuckle or, mm. or straight boxing, like game bread boxing. Okay. Um, yeah, I, that's the that's the rumor. They keep talking about it, even on podcasts. They were on a podcast <laughs> together, talking <laughs> talking smack to each other about wanting to fight, which was just awesome too. I mean, I'm not going to hate. I'm a big fan of Mike Perry. I've always been cool with Mike. Um, I don't know Darren, uh, you know. So I think I think Mike would take that fight and, and do very well. He's just a different animal, man. But um, yeah, if Darren ever wanted to come to the pit, I would love to welcome him. You know, and, and that would be an awesome fight. That that would be a good poll for Cry Combat as well, wouldn't it? Probably yeah, it'd be huge. Huge, oh, wouldn't it? If huge, they could get it. huge, huh? huge. Just chuck some money, well, out especially there, with a, with a Fuck. growing UK audience. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, that would be that would be a game changer, wouldn't it? Yeah, you know, what I mean? yeah. someone like him, in. especially where he's not really doing fuck all. I don't, yeah. know, you know what I mean, from his point of view. Yeah, it's like perfect for him. It's perfect for him, isn't it? Yeah. Is is there much money behind the, the the promotion at the moment to draw in big names like that? I mean, you look at the last show in Vegas, and you had Anthony Pettis, Benson Anderson. So mm, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. I would I would argue yes. Yeah. No, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. If you could. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, d- I didn't actually get around to watching that fight. Did Pettis do any uh, ninja kicks out of interest? Uh, it, it wasn't as dynamic as you expected it to. I mean, there, he threw some spinning kicks, and mm. I, I didn't really think he had an opportunity to do a whole lot off the wall. Um, yeah. You know, I, I thought Benson um, Benson was impressive. You know, I think he fought a lot better than most people expected him to. Uh, which was cool to see to see him come out and you know do his thing. Those guys are just they know each other so well, so it was just such a cl- razor thin fight. They went to a sixth round as well, so you know it, it was cool. It was cool to see Anthony won, um, but yeah, I mean you could argue again it, it should have went the other way. I, I don't know. You got to watch it a couple times without sound and judge for yourself. Yeah, no, I'll go check that out later. I totally, yeah, I totally forgot that even happened. That's awesome. Um, Ross, tell us about your background there, mate. You've already kind of alluded to it a couple of times. Um, you were a bit of a phenom growing up and, and obviously didn't put on any any gloves till till your sort of late 20s. But how did you yeah. start in karate? What age and, and how did that come about? Yeah, I started when I was seven. Uh, it's funny, this always comes up in interviews. Um, I've said it a million times. I'll say it again. You know, I, I didn't really want to do martial arts. I was more of kind of a rambunctious kid. I didn't thinking of sitting still and listening to someone tell me what to do just wasn't really my style. Uh, my brother started martial arts. I have an older brother. He started before me. Um, he was two years older than me and he was getting, uh, you know, bullied a little bit in school. So he jumped into martial arts. He would take class and I would rollerblade up and down the street while he was, uh, you know, taking class. So one day he went to an uh, inner school tournament and uh, he won a trophy, brought it home and I liked the trophy. So when he fell asleep, I took the trophy, put it next to my bed And uh, obviously that didn't fly in my household. So my dad's like, listen, you want that? You got to go and, you know, train and and learn how to do some of that and you can do it yourself. So got into it for those reasons and uh, never looked back. And then I started with uh, the sport karate. I just fell in love with competition. I've always been a competitive person, whether it be against others or even just with myself. So, you know, um, I really took the competition and just kind of grew in that venue for you know, for as long as I can remember, I really didn't stop doing sport karate until I was about 30. Mm-hmm. And did you ever like cross train with other sports or other martial arts or was it always strict karate that you did? So yeah, I, uh, I played a bunch of sports really just with my friends, um, you know, baseball, football, soccer, basketball. Um, you know, I never super, I was never an amazing athlete or any of that. I just enjoyed playing all sorts of sports. So, you know, I play anything if you if you ask me to go play. But um, yeah, it's always essentially martial arts has always been the constant in my life. So I always stuck with that. And then uh, I, I've been studying to be a physical therapist. So when I left left home, which is Brooklyn, New York, and I moved up to New Hampshire to pursue my doctorate, um, I started training with Team Link up in New Hampshire, and that was my first introduction to any type of full contact kickboxing. Mm-hmm. And what was your uh, before you kind of made it to to where you are now? What was your biggest What was your biggest achievement? Gosh, I mean, there, there's so many competitions, you know. Um, so it's it's hard to say. I, I really look at like who I was competitive against and who mm-hmm. I was beating, uh, as opposed to you know, I won this event or I won that event because it would just compete so much as a sport karate athlete. I mean, there's 52 weeks in a year. I was probably competing at my peak 
at least 35, 38 events a year. So it's like they, they all kind of blend together. But I've competed against some of the best in the world. You know, I've competed against Raymond Daniels, who's a household name for many who, who are MMA and kickboxing fans. Um, I competed against, you know, the UK's Michael Page. Um, so, I, you know, I competed against Mike a long time ago. And, you know, just being able to say that I fought some of these guys and beat a lot of these guys and, you know, was, uh, was at the top of that sport for a very long time. Um, really means a lot to me. So, yeah, I wouldn't say my greatest achievement was any one particular win, mm -hmm. but um, just, uh, you know, amassing all of that experience, fighting some of the best in the world is something I can really hang my hat on. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing, mate. And have you ever had like a low point or is it always, uh, have you always been able to kind of manage the stress fairly well? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say a low point as far as stress mm -hmm. management. I mean, but it's it's challenging, you know, when you uh, you get to a point, I think towards the end of my career as a point fighter, when I really started to get into, you know, kickboxing and I started getting more in, involved in that, I, I think the low point was not knowing when to let go, you know, where mm -hmm. I was really putting all of my time into kickboxing in full contact. I wasn't training as much as a point fighter, but I was still going to these events and competing and not doing as well as I should have. Um, and it took my coaches kind of pulling me aside, be like, Hey man, you're not who you used to be. You either, you either do this full time and go for it for real or hang it up, retire because you're ruining your legacy. So at that point I said, you know what? You're right. I'm going to give this one more year. I'm going to finish out the year and dominate here as a point fighter. And then I'm going to close the book and move on. And that's what I did. And I had an amazing year. My last year, you know, I won, I think I went to like five or six events, won everything, dominated against some of the best competitors in the world, and then shut the door on that. And I was able to move along and, and you know, put all of my efforts into, you know, kickboxing, which eventually turned, you know, led me to glory kickboxing. Mm -hmm. And I always like to ask this to, to sort of well-accomplished martial artists in particular, but, you know, world champions as well. I mean... It's, a, it's an achievement that few obviously ever ever get to. I mean, what, what do you think makes you different if you could put, if you could box it, or, you know, if you could sort of bottle it up and, and sell it, what would it be? Yeah, man, I, just my work ethic. Uh, I, mm. think, um, I think my work ethic is second to none. Uh, I really do think I work harder than everybody. Um, I have a good, uh, you guys swear on this at all? Yeah, okay. fucking yeah. Well, I know you guys are like, ah, we're, yeah. I don't <laughs> care. Um, I, I have a good bullshit meter. You know, I read people really well. And uh, I think I'm blessed with the ability to figure out who is, uh, is really in my corner and who is not, who's just there for the ride. So uh, I kind of see through that very, very well. And because of that, I kept a very tight circle my entire life and my entire career. So I think aside from the fact that I've been surrounded by some unbelievable coaches, um, I also know how to shut my mouth and listen and do what I have to do and, and just follow almost blindly you know, to, to go to success, you know, because uh, the people that I've followed that have been my mentors have all been successful and I will never question success. You know, when you've shown the path, I'm going to do whatever you did and I'm going to do it hopefully better, you know? So, um, I think I, I was never really blessed with uh, a super athletic body. My, uh, my athletic prowess has come later in my career but when i was younger i was never the biggest the strongest the fastest i always had to outwork people you know use my mind use my grit kind of blue collar you know never give up type of mentality i know it sounds kind of cheesy but it's true you know i always kind of had to be the hard-nosed guy and you know i didn't grow up in a in a bad neighborhood but a lot of the the competitions around me you know just i was the minority i was the only white kid that was going around and competing and you know um everyone expected me to lose so you know, I just went out there and, and wanted to just show everyone that I'm the guy, you know. Mm -hmm. So no matter what my, uh, my challenges were, you know, physically, I was always able to overcome that with some hard work. Yeah, amazing. And I, I, I thought something when you mentioned earlier that you, had, you didn't put gloves on until you were sort of 27, 28. I think you said 27, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and, and I think about, you know, some of the, the kind of household names that we, we kind of familiar with now and the, the, the fighters that are, are maybe sort of into their late thirties and, and, and early forties. And you sometimes start to see a bit of a decline in the career around that age. But I, I wonder with you, because you weren't taking any sort of concussive blows or, or not many um, intentionally for, for all that time, it almost, I don't know. I wonder if you're going to have like more longevity as a result of not having that, that, that that sort of brain injury that so typically it's the miles on the clock. Yeah, it? yeah. He's not got those miles. Yeah. Do you, do you think that plays a role? 
I do. I think it plays a huge role. Um, mm. I think I'm in better physical shape now than I was 10 years ago. I think the the 36 year old Ross, you know, puts a beating on the 26 year old Ross easily. You mm. know, it wouldn't even be a contest. Um, you know, I think I'm in such a different league and, and especially now with my, with my career as well as, you know, I have a doctor in physical therapy, so I know how to take care of my body. Um, I've been working with a nutritionist, strength coaches, like I just, um, I have all the right team around me that have been able to preserve me. And, and yeah, like you said, I don't, I don't have the tread on my tires. I don't have all those miles, you know, so my body feels good. I'm not waking up in pain. You know, I'm not, my brain's not hurting. I'm not, you know, nervous to spar. So, you know, with all of that on my side, you know, if I wanted to continue and do this for another three, four years, I, I certainly could. And I think mm -hmm. I could do it at a high level. Yeah. And what does your sparring look like these days, mate? Do you spar hard or are you still very cautious around the headshots? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of concussions and, and the damage that they can do and the damage they've caused. And, you know, nowadays we have all the data that shows that, right? You know, 20 yeah. years ago, everyone was sparring hard because that's mm -hmm. all you knew. You had to get that feeling of what a fight looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, now we know that's not really the, the right answer. So I have some great sparring partners um, and great coaches and great mentors that we all keep a very tight group where we have some high level guys, world champions in the room and we spar very hard. You know, we go hard to the body, hard to the legs and we control ourselves to the head because, you know, most of us have jobs, you know, jobs, families that we got to go home to. And, we also understand that combat sports is a very small window. This is not stuff that you're going to do into your 50s and 60s. So, you know, it's a very short time to be able to be successful and, and leave your mark and, you know, come out of it alive, as they say, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we uh, we definitely get some good hard rounds in, but, um, you know, we're also very aware of how to take care of each other, which is important. Yeah, definitely. And, and I feel like if, if I could name one martial art or one discipline that could go hard and still pull their punches, it'd probably be karate, right? So you're in the right sport. I guess so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I mean, listen, the, the longer you do anything, the, the more the more you kind of learn. You know, we call it black belt control, but, you know, everybody can have that. You just have to learn your, learn your strengths and, and be just, don't be a jackass. That's like, that's rule number one, you know, is like with our gym is we, the most important person in the room is your partner. If you don't take care of your partner, if you break your toys, you're not going to have anything to play with, right? So you got you need your team. You cannot do this alone. I know it's an individual sport. You go into the ring or I go into the pit, you know, by myself. But if I don't have all my training partners and my coaches behind me, it's useless. If I don't have a good training camp, what am I doing? You know, so I got to be taking care of my training partners and making sure they're taking care of me too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. And then I wanted to um, to ask about obviously the the day job because uh, you've mentioned uh, a couple of times that you're a doctor in physical therapy. Yep. And in addition to the fighting, I also enjoy your content around injury and Thank and everything you. else. So is it? Um, I mean, I assume you're not training full time. You know, full, full time in the sense that that's all you do. It, it sounds like you also practice as a physical therapist as well. Is that is that the case? That is the case. Yeah. I mean, I, okay. I like to consider it as two full-time jobs um, because yeah. I definitely, I definitely train full-time. You know, there, yeah, okay. there is no, there is no lack in my training. Um, I train crazy hard. I think I train a lot harder than most. I'm not working in clinic anymore. I used to work as a, as a physiotherapist in clinic. Um, now I've started my own company that's been, been around uh, almost two years. July will be two years where uh, I own Turbo Sports Performance and it's uh, all remote. So I can, work with anyone all over the world. Um, I have a couple of great coaches underneath me. Um, one of my head coaches, Zach Ben Bushta, is also a martial artist, combat athlete. He's on the karate combat roster too, funny enough. Um, trains up at TriStar with the you know GSP, that whole crew. He's also a physio. He's an unbelievable athlete, unbelievable therapist. Um, so he coaches under me. And uh, my strength coach, Brad West, is also coaching in my program. But, you know, we uh, it's completely remote. We work with uh, almost exclusively combat athletes all over the world. Yeah, that's awesome. We had um, Dr. Kickass, uh, Mike uh, Pakowski oh, on nice. the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, obviously, he's coming at it from more of a grappling and jiu-jitsu perspective, but he had some really interesting insights. I mean, from your perspective as, as a fighter and a, a physio, I mean, what what do you what do you think sort of people can do or athletes or combat athletes specifically can do to maybe avoid injury? Because obviously it's it's uh it's the bane of our lives, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think avoiding injury, uh, you'd be lying if you told anybody that hey, if you did this, you won't get hurt. Mm. Like if, 
that's just not the case, you know, so it's more maintenance. Um, I think what a lot of people don't do, whether they're competitive or not, I think there's not enough uh, emphasis on strength and conditioning um, and nutrition. You know, mm-hmm. I think those two things are super important. You know, ever since I started uh, a routine strength and conditioning that has never stopped, you know, even when I'm not in fight camp, I'm always on a strength and conditioning routine that's, you know, built to when I'm off camp, you know, we, we start building my weaknesses, the areas that I really need help with to, to improve overall as an athlete. And that's going to, in the, in turn, maintain my health when I do get into those hard training camps and also nutrition, you know, being able to not have the yo-yo diet of like, I'm cutting weight, I'm eating whatever I want. Like there's that, there's a big gap in between where you have to maintain. And, and, you know, it's like, I always say, if you had a Ferrari, you can't put, you know, regular gas in a Ferrari, it's going to break down. You got to eat the right things and treat your body right. Um, you know, like I mentioned before, it's a small window. You know, you can be disciplined for this small window if you really want to go far in the sport. So I think those are the two big things that I, I always recommend people, especially when we start working together is, listen, we're going to we're gonna help you get rid of these injuries whatever, if you have one now. Um, or if you're just looking for maintenance, we're going to get you stronger. There, there's no such thing as maintenance. It's always, you know, trying to progress and trend in the right direction and, and make improvements so that, that's something you can do to kind of battle the injuries. And this way, when you do get hurt, because it's inevitable in a combat sport, at least it's going to be less severe and fewer and for, further in between. So that's, that's really the goal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your strength and conditioning program, what does that typically look like? Is it, you know, is it heavy weights? Is it Olympic lifting? Is it plyometrics? Yeah, it really depends on the phase. I mean, the, I can mm-hmm. talk at length. We, we could talk a whole other hour about, you know, strength and conditioning and how those phases are important. You know, I could say right now I'm in what we call like a, a GPP phase is a general physical preparedness. So I don't have any fights coming up. You know, the, the goal is let's get strong. You know, let's improve on some of the areas, maybe work some movements that I haven't worked before or that I don't need to work when I'm in camp, like full range of motion exercises, you know, different muscle groups that aren't as important right now when I'm when I'm trying to be explosive in my fight camp. So it's all about, you know, building endurance, building strength, improving my baseline so that if my last fight camp, my baseline strength was here, the next fight camp, my baseline strength is here. I get a little bit better, a little bit stronger, a little bit bigger you know, and continue to develop. When my fight camp starts, we start with a strength phase. So again, um, especially when I'm cutting weight, you know, we want to put on as much muscle as we can, because as I cut down, I'm going to lose some of that muscle as I lose weight. So it's really like build up so that when I start to cut, I can maintain. Then we transition to a power phase, which is all about nervous system, get my nervous system firing so that when I do, when my brain says, throw this punch, it knows how to utilize every single muscle in the right way. Uh, so that's going to imp- include a lot of plyometrics, a little bit more of the heavy lifting. Um, I don't personally do a ton of Olympic lifting just because mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's it's technical and it's risky if you don't really know it very well. Um, but there's a lot of other moves that are similar to like uh, some Olympic lifts. And then we get into our speed phase. And that's all about, you know, building that explosive power at the very end. Uh, and that leads me right up into my fight. So that's kind of like the nuts and bolts. I know I gave a lot of information without being too sciencey, but yeah, there's, there's so much research and so much data behind, you know, how to build a successful, you know, triphasic program. And that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'm quite familiar with some of that stuff. That was good. Um, and how much, how much weight do you put into things like flexibility work? Because we also had um, Cameron Shane, if you're familiar with that, with that gentleman. But um, he was of the opinion that more maybe with jujitsu, I guess, than, than striking arts. But he was of the opinion that if you're doing five hours of strength work, you then need to do five hours of flexibility work. I mean, what's your split of the two? I mean, I don't think you have 10 hours in a week to be doing all that. <laughs> well, that was my argument. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but what I will say is um, it, it is definitely important. I think flexibility plays a huge, huge role in jiu-jitsu in particular mm. because you know flexibility means I've got a little bit more leeway on the offensive and defensive side, right? So you know, it's the ability to, you know, challenge those kind of stress receptors in your joints so that you can withstand some of that. It's almost like the more flexible you are, you have built in defense, right? Just with the exception of like certain positions. But um, I always say this, there's like five elements to a good program is strength, endurance, flexibility, mobility, and stabilization. You know, 
all five of those are interrelated. You can't have strength without flexibility. You can't be flexible without being stable. And you can't do all of that without endurance, right? So it just, you have to balance it out. It's not a one-to-one ratio. Everyone is a little bit different. There are some people who are just naturally a little more flexible. Some mm-hmm. people got to work on it. So, you know, and one of the things that we do with uh, with my program is it's all tailored individually. It's not a one size fits all program. Nothing is cookie cutter. You know, we do a, like very thorough evaluations and comprehensive screens with our clients and make sure that we figure out, you know, what are your true needs? What is it that we need to build on so that you can become the better version of yourself? So it's all interrelated. You can't isolate one group or another. You have to include all of it. Uh, but I would not agree with it being one to one, five hours to five hours. I think that's unrealistic. Yeah, no, fair enough. I was just curious of your opinion. And then sort of personally for yourself, man, what have have you, have you had many injuries over the years or have you uh, been quite lucky? Yeah. I mean, I I would say I've been quite lucky for sure. Mm. Um, I definitely, you know, knock on wood, all all that good stuff. Uh, I haven't, I haven't had any major, major injuries that have like taken me out of fights or anything like that. And I hopefully that remains. Um, but I've had some substantial injuries. I've torn my hamstring. I've had, um, you know, right before my title for my first title fight, uh, when I fought Shaheen Adamov a couple of years back, I had some really, really big injuries. I had my first day of sparring, grade two MCL sprain in my knee. Um, I just had a, a, a teammate try and sweep me and I was just too buckled down and my knee gave. So we had to cut sparring out altogether. I sparred twice for that entire fight camp um, leading into my first five round title fight. So that was a little uh, nerve wracking. And then uh, because we put so much emphasis since I couldn't spar, I'm like, well, I'm going to lift and make sure I'm super strong. I uh, herniated a disc deadlifting, you know, like four weeks out from the fight. Yeah. Uh, so it is what it is. But, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I definitely had some injuries that I've had to overcome. That's part of the game, man. You know, you mm-hmm. go through it and, and luckily I have the knowledge and the tools and the resources to recognize these injuries and not know when to push and know when to back off and know when we have to go into like rehab mode versus, uh, you know, suck it up and keep going. Cause sometimes that is the answer. But in most cases, we have to be a little bit more in tune with our body. So I'm just very fortunate that I have the background and, and like I said, the the tools and resources to recognize it and then also treat it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And uh, I know sort of with things like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, looking at sort of some of the literature, there, there's, there's a fair few studies in regard to injuries. Um but they're almost quite easy to predict because most of the mechanisms mechanisms of injury are from competing and, and joint locks. Sure. Um, but then you look at other sports that aren't strictly sort of combat or contact, like, I don't know, football or soccer. Um, and we can see that there's, because of the the, 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 the the demand on the body, there's certain injuries that you see quite often. Is there much literature in regard to sort of uh, striking or, or karate uh, in regard to the typical injuries that you would see? I think it's just so random. It's so random. Like you can bet if you're watching American football, you're every single year you're going to see ACL tears. You're going so to see, yeah. you're going to see ACL tears. You're going to see Achilles injuries because mm. uh, these guys are too big, too fast, and all they know how to do is go forward as fast as they can, as hard as they can. Mm. They don't know how to stop. They don't know how to turn. You know, or I shouldn't say they don't know how. Obviously, they don't know how. But their body is too too overdeveloped. They don't develop mm. the brakes enough. Um, I think my biggest, uh, you know, my biggest pet peeve with like NFL athletes is they don't work on like slowing down. Everything you ever see them doing is bigger, stronger, faster. How do you mm. slow down? That's why you see these guys come out of breaks and they blow their ACLs, they blow mm. their hamstrings, they blow their Achilles. They just don't know how to. St- it's all posterior stuff. Um, yeah. With combat sports, it's so random, you know, because you're you're scrambling. You know, I think wrestlers, it's always something different with a wrestler because you just can't predict what someone else is going to do. You know, if it was, uh, you know, if it was track and field, you can predict what I'm doing. Or if this was a skill position, you can predict, you know, the types of movements that we have to do. But, you know, combat athletes are, are the ultimate hybrid athletes, right? We have to be able to go forward, backward, lateral. Um, we have to be able to give punishment, receive punishment. It's just such a crazy, random sport that you really see the whole gamut. Mm. And then we're not even talking about concussions. It's a whole nother, a whole nother discussion, right? So, I mean, it really is a, a, a unique, you know, sport. There was a really cool study done on women uh, soccer players um, that 
they they never learn how to decelerate. So Correct. their knees are soft and then they just, yeah, the ligaments go. Yeah, well, I think females are really quad dominant anyway. Yeah. So they, they, they introduced Nordic cows, if you're familiar with those. Oh, yeah. Um, I think the study was, it was, it was, it was the Nordic, the, it was the Swedish yeah. study, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they, they introduced Nordic cows in their, in their, in their sort of pre season uh, schedule and it reduced injuries like massively. It's so. a huge problem though in women's football at the moment, ACL injuries. Yeah, know. yeah. I, I believe female, female soccer is still uh, the leading ACL, um, the leading ACL sport. But yeah, it's just, again, everything is built on how do I go faster forward? So, mm -hmm. you know, the, one of the biggest tear rates is, uh, you know, or one of the things that we see a lot with ACL tears is we call it the quad hamstring ratio. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how strong is your quad compared to how strong is the hamstring? It's the gas and the brake. Yeah. If your brake can't match what the gas is giving and you go to stop and turn, forget it. Your body's going this way. We're trying to go that way, and the rest of my body's still going this way. So some something has to give, right? And, and that's unfortunately the ACL. Yeah, that's a great analogy, by the way. I've not heard that. That's um, yeah, it makes it's good sense. I like yeah, it. Good. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that's why those Nordics come in handy because it's, it's mm. all hamstring rehab, right, or prehab. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of that with our ACL athletes. We do a ton of glute loading, a ton of hamstring loading, and then you know single leg exercises. I think we don't do enough single leg work as as a population, as athletes in general, um, mm -hmm. a lot of single leg work so that we're prepared for, you know, kind of these random movements and then, you know, try and prep as best as you can. And at the end of the day, all you can do is prepare and then do this when you go out for your sport, because, you know, like, like we said, combat sports is just so crazy. Yeah. hundred percent. I saw a recent post that you did in regard to, um, basically go into your, your, your sort of general practitioner about injury. Um, it, it made me laugh because I, you know, the, the U S and the UK are very different in many ways, but that's so true in the UK as well. I, I've been there in the past where I, I went to the, to, to the GP because of an injury and it was, Oh, how, how did you do it? I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. What's that? Well, it's like grappling, wrestling. Oh, so stop doing that. Three months, come back. If it's still a problem, but look at it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Just stop. Like, well, I don't, I don't really have that option. So, see, like, <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it's almost, it's almost so, like they, they don't even care you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's like they, they just don't even care about well this is my passion how many people do you know are martial artists like simply for their mental health mm. we talk about it all the time yeah and you're gonna tell somebody to stop for you know 10 to 12 weeks because you have an injury like come on we we all know we could do different things you know I, I tell people all the time oh you have an elbow injury okay cool go to the gym you got another arm you got two legs you got knees you got elbows like there's so many different things you can work on. Like you just get in there and do it and it'll, it'll solve so many other problems while you get better. Not only that, but you're going to develop skills that are going to make you better when you are hundred percent again. So yeah, there's always ways around it. We just got to make it happen. Yeah. They're so bad though. They? I remember going, when I, when I played football, um, I went to the doctors, I had a really bad knee and it was like, I, was, I carried on playing, playing on it for a couple of weeks. And I went to the doctors, made an appointment, sat there and he just was like, just, just, yeah, just don't play. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? Just don't play. In the end, I had to go and get a private scan, got it all done. And uh, I tore my VMO and it was like a stapler. It was like disgusting. I was out for like six months with it. But his thing was just, yeah, just rest it. You know, I was luckily I didn't need surgery because it kind of like heart healed. Yeah. I think the, the issue that you've got in the UK, and I imagine it's probably the same in the, in the US, Ross, but the, 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 the GPs in the UK, they... They simply do not have any training on sort of on on exercise, nutrition, you Hormones. know, nothing at all. So they they it's 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 almost like a, it's almost like an ignorance. It's not even that they just can't be asked. They just don't know. So they don't know what to say. So they just say, "Stop doing what you're doing." And I, I think that's a, a larger big issue. Yeah, we we say the same thing. You know, surgeons do surgery. You know, mm. that, that's what they do. Most uh, most general practitioners are practitioners are internal medicine you know they're internalists yeah. so you know it's uh, i don't expect them to know but at the same time i think the the big push at least in the u.s i don't know how this is in the uk but you know physiotherapists are the movement specialists you know so but we're not looked at that way by society you know where we're not seen that way we're only seen as the specialist because we get referred from the doctor so unless mm -hmm. unless your gp says hey you should go to physical therapy and work on this you don't get that opportunity. So now we're, there's a big push in the U.S. for what we call direct access, where if you have an injury, 
you know, let's say you, you know, you roll your ankle or your knee hurts, you can come directly to me. You don't need to, to go see your general practitioner first. Um, and then, you know, for me, the, the second tier to that is how many physiotherapists are martial artists, you know, a very small percentage. So if you're doing martial arts, you're doing jujitsu and you're going to a physiotherapist who really has a, an extensive background in baseball, you're going to be stuck answering the same questions because they're going to be like, oh, what's jujitsu? What's that? Mm -hmm. So for me, that was why I opened up my own business and made it remote so that anybody all over the world can reach me. And they know that when they talk to me, not only they're talking about somebody who knows what they're doing, but they're talking to a world champion and they're talking to someone who's still active and doing it. So just the relatability alone is going to make you feel comfortable and, and know that I'm going to give you the right information. So that, that's really my goal, man. I just want to provide a service that, uh, you know, I never had growing up and start to change the game in the future and, you know, lay the groundwork for other people that are like me that can go and make a big influence in the sport. Yeah. Uh, so sounds good, mate. Where do, uh, where do people find you if they want to come in to check out your services? Yeah, I appreciate the the opportunity to plug that. Um, best way is just follow my Instagram. I know you like some of the content. Uh, it's cool that you've seen some of that. But uh, my Instagram is the best way. It's at Ross underscore Turbo underscore Levine. That is the best way. Just follow some of my content. Shoot me a DM. And, you know, if, uh, if anybody out there listening and needs some help or, or just even has some some questions, wants to, you know, have a chat, uh, I'm very approachable. And, and I answer every single one of my DMs, you know, regardless. So uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to plug that. No, no problem, mate. And and just to sort of close up, um, just thinking about, I guess, the karate combat fans and maybe those that aren't familiar with the sport. Is there any anything you'd say to to sort of the, the fans and, and people maybe sort of spectating the sport? Yeah, listen, if you're a fan of combat sports and, um, you know, that there's always going to be something that you like or don't like about sports. You know, there's so many people that follow MMA and they're, they love the striking and hate the ground fighting. Or they love jujitsu and they don't really care for the, you know, the, the stand-up. So I think Karate Combat just provides a new environment, um, a new arena, a new pit, like different athletes, uh, a little bit of, of craziness in the lead up. Um, it's just different. If you're looking for a new refreshing kind of breath of fresh air and, and uh, there's always more space for combat sports. So if you want to see it, and um, I really highly encourage you to, to look at some of these athletes and you're going to recognize that even though you haven't heard of us, we, we are just as talented and, and just as capable as some of the household names that you see. So um, I definitely recommend give it a watch and, uh, and see how different it is and, and become a fan. Awesome. Ross, awesome to meet you, mate. Really appreciate your time. And uh, yeah, it's been a fun chat. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Thank you, mate. My pleasure. Thank you guys again for, uh, for chatting with me. I, I love being with you. You guys ask some awesome questions. Keep doing what you're doing. And anytime you need another guest, I'm here for you. Thanks, brother. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thank you. Appreciate it, y'all.